getting a gaming group is really hard, let's face it. So sometimes playing just with one other person is the only option that we have. But unfortunately, not every game makes that easy to do. That is why there is Beowulf. Beowulf Age of Heroes is a monster slaying adventures for one GM and one player from Handiworks Games. I backed this when it came to came to Kickstarter a while ago. I have gone through it and read it a few weeks ago. Uh, has it been actually worth the amount of time I had to invest to get to grips with it? I'm about to tell you. Welcome to the GMS Magazine RPG review video. As usual, let's start with the production of the book, which is fan blooming tastic. This is a game created by Handy Work, which is led by Johnny Hoxon, which is probably the best art director in the industry. Sorry for the other art directors, but Johnny is my favorite, and that's where it is, and I will keep saying it forever and ever 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 and ever. And this game it looks fan beautiful. Just fan beautiful. To the point that, look, uh, let's see if I can show you. Yeah, that is the level of detail that's gone into the creation of this book. The cover is beautiful and it tells the story of the hero that slain this massive serpent. And um, there's more because look at how it's looking at the world that's opening. Yes, this is based on the Beowulf poem and the heroics that were going on at that time in history, prehistory, Bronze Ages, sort of time. There's a lot to do at the time, believe me. I was a little bit skeptic, but no more. What's the book like inside? As you can imagine, it is absolutely packed with glorious illustrations all over the book. Hardly a page goes when there isn't one or more illustrations. Lovely cartography, great level of detail. As I said, John is the best art direction in the industry. Uh, so this had to work. It was really going to work very, very well indeed. Loads of illustrations. There is a great description of the world at the time how it works, what the distances are treated like, the difference between paganism at the time and what Christianity is doing. And yes, the book goes into explaining a little bit that, you know, you don't need to be a dick about Christianity in this book and you don't need to be a dick about not having Christianity or decided that the old gods are the only gods. It's entirely up to you. They just put it out there, then you do with it whatever you want. Of course, Christianity at the time was quite important because it was an emerging religion and it was taking place. It gives a good amount of ideas for adventuring. Now, this is a 5e book, which means I'm not going to go into the rules of how they work. Instead, I'm going to concentrate on what it provides to play with just one GM and one player. Let's continue with the world a little bit. There is a ton of things uh, that describe the gods as they used to be, uh, all the um, how wealth is meant to work, how societies are meant to work, what the kings and queens are, and what the, are the sizes of those kingdoms. Because we are not talking necessarily of you know country as we understand them today. A kingdom could have been a very small province that just happens to be self-sufficient, and and that's that's the way it goes. Going forward a little bit more, see, we, we, we see some of the gods in here and there's no need for you not to add more gods to this book if you wanted to and add new pantheons and new religions to it. Now, there's plenty of um, new rules, you know, and this game is based on the hero class. Yes, every player is meant to be 
a hero of sorts. It's a character that is going to be well above the average of the rest of the world. It's the kind of character that can defeat any monster out there if they find a way to actually become making them become defeatable. More on that in a minute. Those are the characters. So there is a very specific premise as of the type of character that you're going to be able to play here. That doesn't mean that you cannot customize your character and your hero to be the way you want them to be, but you are going to be playing a hero, not common folk, just so you know. Okay, creating the hero is a fairly, you know, straightforward event. You're going to select, yeah, among the optional rules of character creation for 5e, you're going to create the optional rules, you're going to decide what are the quirks of the character, you're going to create the background for the character, what kind of, you know, sort of, I don't know, archetype you want to be. You know, if you want to be a noble, what is it going to be like? Oh, by the way, it would be best if you don't use in this game overtly fantastic creatures like Dragonborn and that sort of thing, because they're meant to be taking place on what today is England and Wales and Scotland, the United Kingdom and Ireland, because this is meant to be taking place in Albion. So, I mean, you could, if you wanted to, to have Dragonborn, you know, flying around there if you wanted to, but I don't see it. It's your game. You do with it whatever you want. It's your table. So, there are plenty of tables to uh, create personality traits and ideals and what are the flaws of the hero, because, you know, even heroes are vulnerable and flawed. So, you need to decide how it's going to go, what, what's the destiny that awaits the heroes, so on and so forth. As you can see, there are loads and loads of info. There is a very great list of equipment, which, although it's not mega long pages long, but it tells you all that you need very concisely, very clearly, which is lovely. There's some arms of the time. Yeah, plenty of magic, don't worry about that. There will be plenty of magic. And war gear, how to buy the equipment. Ships, ships are very, very important. You're going to need one because you're going to be, well, sailing around from place to place so you can go and defeat the monster. And the ship has been designed mechanically as the kind of default, de facto means of transportation, which means that you are going to need a crew. And that is where this game begins to shine. Because you might be thinking, well, I'm a hero alone. No, no, no. Oh, not alone at all. You're going to have companions. You, as a player, are going to be playing your hero and your companions. Oh, so much work. No, not at all. How does Beowulf do this? Mwah. Love it. Imagine an NPC, you strip down all the information that may become unnecessary, like, for example, fighting info or stats, that sort of thing. You just get very, very basic information about your follower because the follower is meant to do that. Follow, not do the work for you. They can do a few things for you, but not the work. They are not the ones that are going to fight Grendel. No, no, no. No, you do that. They may help you by sharpening your weapons, carrying things. Perhaps if one of them knows how to bake, or perhaps they can bake a cake for that king that is a little bit, mm, I don't know if I should trust you. That is how they're going to do. So your followers are going to have flaws and they're going to have good things they can do, traits. Um, I love that. I really, really love that. Because you have to look after them. You have to nurture them. Because don't get me wrong, there, is, there are rules for you to lose your followers. You know, if, if you don't allow your followers to interact, 
eventually the GM may be saying, well, what's the point of them being there? You're just doing, you know, you're not counting on them at all. So why have them there? They can be a tool for the GM to say, you know, they have kidnapped your followers. Now what are you going to do? Or well, that follower is kind of becoming disenchanted because followers also have burdens. And with those burdens, you know, I miss my family. I'm following you, but I miss my family. How are you going to make up for that? You're not just meant to be a hero for the people that you're meant to be helping slaying the monster. No, 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 no. You're also meant to be a hero to me, your follower, because otherwise, what's the point of you? Why should I follow you? So you have to be very mindful of that, and GM can use that wisely to make it a lot more interesting for everyone. That's genius. That is so good. And to be perfectly honest, it is something that could easily be extrapolated to any 5e game. Really loving it. You have your heroic fits. That, well, you know, for heroes. Followers, as I was saying, they have their own whole chapter and you can create how it goes into how to make them, how to get rid of them, how to let them go, how to help them become heroes. What happens when they die? All of those things are there for you. You know, how to create their gifts, their, their burdens. All of that is here for you. And believe me, in these pages, to me, is the most interesting part of the game. I will probably be using this for any regular 5e game for any kind of followers. Because sometimes you find these classes are all paladins. When you get to level 10, you're meant to have a school of paladinium sim, and then you're meant to be able to have followers, but they never tell you how to do it. This does, and you can take it to that game, which is really super duper great. Now, the adventure. This is where the game is a little bit, ah, oh, wait, 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 because it comes with a very specific formula to create the adventure in the sense that the hero has to be embark in a journey, in a trip, so they can go to faraway lands where there is a monster that has to be defeated. It's always pretty much the same. So although you can create your campaigns, but mm, it can be a little bit... Ah, for that, what's very good though is that Handiwork Games has created an awful lot of adventures for this. So you don't have to worry too much about it if you're running out of ideas. They have plenty of support for the line. So that helps a lot. Another good thing about how to prepare adventures for this game is that it guides you through, for instance, creating the portent. With the portent, is going to be like going to an oracle and getting some sort of prediction. And that prediction, which is very abstract, is very difficult to really know what it is like, but it's just there to nudge you in the right direction if you need to, or to use it if you need to get some sort of idea as to where to go or how the adventure is going to go. Uh, they have a couple of, of tables where you use objectives and nouns to create those portents. And as I said, they were just, you know, kind of nudging you in the right direction. All the challenges that you get, what kind of land you can obtain, creating adventures for this, as I said, a little bit contriving because it's meant to always take place in a journey, but there are plenty of, of choices out there. So. It depends how you want to look at it. You may want to get away with the whole ship thing and do something else completely. That's fine. But this is what this is asking you to do. Another thing I liked an awful lot is how it goes into society, how the mad hall and the mystery is meant to work, how the kings are meant to be in this open kind of communal space that you can come in and if you are welcome, then you're one of the tribe. And if you're not welcome, then you better go elsewhere. Society is described beautifully. The land is described very, very nicely. How to interact with other people is very well done. The chapter on treasures is pretty good. Magic is not meant to be the super spectacular sort of magic that you see in all the D&D or 5e um, settings, but it is there. 
And then we get an adventure. And yes, look, loads of adventure. Another way that this book truly shines because it introduces you very gently into the monsters. Monsters, that, by the way, are undefeatable. Yes, you cannot kill a monster unless certain conditions have been met. For instance, that you find what is the rare ore that makes them vulnerable, or where have they, you know, kept their hearts so you can actually crush the heart and then their body becomes vulnerable to normal weapons or whatever. But until then, they are undefeatable. And yes, you can fight them, and you can fight them very well. And if your hero is lucky, it can bring them down to a very low number of points. And what happens then is that they either flee or they do something special, but they are not defeated. And that is great, because if you think that you can just go out there, find Grendel's lair and just destroy him, it doesn't work like that. You have to work for it. You have to be heroic. So that, I love it so much. And to be honest, defeatable doesn't necessarily mean that you have to kill them. Maybe they go away. Maybe they completely disappear from the land, only to come back years later when you are old and, you know, wrinkled and you have a child that could take the mantle of your heroic deeds and take your weapon and go and find them again. That's how it could work. And that is brilliant. And if you think that you're going to be short of monsters, I'm afraid that you will be very thoroughly mistaken. Because at the end of the book, there are loads and loads of monsters of various levels of might, difficulty, scariness, And they're very good. I mean, they're just amazing. And the only thing I'm missing out of this is a pronunciation guide because I cannot speak Gaelic. So I can pronounce troll, that far I get, but I have no idea how all the monsters from here are pronounced. Like this Grigafool. I, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly. So I wish I could say that. So, quite frankly, regardless of whether you're going to play with just one person or not, there are so many cool ideas, both mechanically and from the setting point of view in this book. It is so beautiful, so nicely written, that this will make a really nice addition to your shelf if you are a 5e player, or simply if you want to read a great looking book with some fantastic information in it. Very well worth it, considering that they are also, and with they I mean Handiworks Game, the company, really supporting this very, very well, you've got nothing to lose at all. You're never going to be short of adventures, you're never going to be short of maps, you're never going to be short of information, you're never going to be short of goodness. And having a game that's been specifically designed to play with just one player, one GM, I'm up for that. So, hands down, has this been worth the amount of time that I had to invest to read it? Absolutely, unequivocally, and undeniably, yes. Let me know what you think. I'd love to hear your thoughts. But until then, thank you so much for being there, and I will talk to you very, very soon. Take care.